guys so excited to be here. I'm happy. Um, my name is Brock Adams. I teach comp over at the uh, Spartanburg campus. I've been asked to come here today and over the next couple of weeks um, to try and give you guys some workshop on, on what we're calling professional writing skills. The idea is I know you guys are really busy. You have lots of classes. A lot of you work full time and stuff. So you don't necessarily have the time to learn everything you have to learn about how to write correctly for classes. Um, and as a teacher, as an English teacher, we see the same problems again and again. We hear the same complaints from teachers about what students lack in writing skills. So what I've tried to do is create in this workshop three kind of hardcore, real fast seminars that are going to get you the absolute basic, absolute most important stuff that's going to help you with writing for your classes. And the one we're going to do today, we're going to focus a bit on critical reading. So basically the idea, what I'd like you to get out of this seminar is to understand how to really get the most out of the stuff that you're reading for class um, again, and also how to use that stuff. How can you actually understand what you read and take the stuff that you read such that you can use it uh, in papers or answers to questions, essay questions, short answers, whatever kind of questions you've got, we're going to try and make sure you can get the information out of the text. So, what is critical reading? Um, raise your hand if you've ever been reading something and all of a sudden you find your eyes have just completely glazed over. You have no idea what you're reading. Pretty much everybody, right? Yeah, sometimes I'll be reading and before I know it I've read like two pages and forgotten everything. Well, this is no good, right? I mean, well, how does that help for class? It doesn't help at all, right? So we want to avoid that. What we want to practice instead is critical reading. We want to make sure that we're reading with purpose. So this is where critical reading comes in. Um, now, usually I don't teach with so much heavy PowerPoint stuff, but I'm going to have a lot of this information up on the board so that when people watch the video later on, uh, they can get everything they need. They can pause it, read the stuff that's up here. For now, if you guys want to take notes, that's fine. But don't worry about getting down every word that's up here. You can always watch it later. Um, I think, am I going to be able, Dr. Prince, to post the PowerPoint as well? Yeah, so don't worry about getting every word down for now, just pay attention. So, critical reading. Reading for understanding of the author's intentions, the meaning of the article itself, and the article's deeper implications and uses. So we're going to talk one at a time about what each one of these things means. Um, so first of all is the author's considerations. Here's something that's really easy to forget when you read tons and tons of essays, is that every essay you've ever read, read was written by some human being. At some point, some man or woman sat down at a computer and said, I want to express something. I want to get some ideas out there. It's not just, you know, stuff that came down from heaven and appeared in your textbook. So we have to try and put ourselves in that author's shoes and think about what was this author trying to accomplish? Who was this author targeting when he or she wrote this particular essay? By putting ourselves in the author's shoes, we'll have a much better understanding of exactly everything that's going on in the text because we'll be able to think like an author. So, when any author sits down to write an essay, he or she thinks about three main things. These are what I call the author's considerations. Go ahead and click one more. Um, in comp, I like to refer to things as rhetorical triangles. We have two or three different rhetorical triangles. We're only going to focus on one today. But the rhetorical triangles are just an easy way to remember different things that are important when thinking about the way that authors write a text. So this particular rhetorical triangle is called author's considerations, and it refers to when that person sits down at the computer, what things is that person considering to help make sure that he or she writes the best text she possibly can. So for this rhetorical triangle, we've got subject, purpose, and audience. So we'll deal with those one at a time. First of all, subject. What do you figure the subject is? What you're writing about, exactly. Subject is pretty self-explanatory. So it's basically what is the article about. Now, understanding the subject is important because depending on how much we know about a subject, we might uh, interpret it differently. So, when we're reading something, we need to understand what is the subject. Okay, is this about education? You guys are mostly education majors, right? Yeah. So, is this about education? What do I already know about this? Is this talking about some psychologist uh, that I'm already familiar with or some teaching method that I've got some sort of experience with? If you already have some sort of experience with it, well, you're already one step ahead, and you can be learning uh, new things from this article. If it's something you're not familiar with, you know you need to pay extra attention because all of this stuff is going to be new to you. Um, you also want to think about what kind of theories or assumptions that are just kind of current are going to help you understand this particular article. Also, to think about the way you interpret the article. So if the article was written today, you need to think about the world of today and how the world of today influences the article. 
If you're reading something older, you're going to have to think about, okay, how does the context of when this was written affect the way that I interpret it? So let's say we're reading a paper, and it's about um, teaching students of different races in your classroom. And that paper was written 150 years ago. Well, what were race relations like 150 years ago? Pretty poor. Pretty poor, right? Would you have had students of different races in your classroom 150 years ago? Absolutely not. Yeah, 150 years ago, we had slavery in this country. So we're going to interpret an article very differently if it was written in 1850. What if it was written in 1950? What were things like? You can shout out the answer. Don't be afraid. <laughs> what, were, what were race relations like in this country in 1950? They're still pretty poor. Segregation. Still pretty bad, right? Segregation. We at least made a small step. People weren't slaves anymore, but we still had a lot of racism in the country, still had segregation, stuff like that. So we would read it, and we would think, if we were reading this without any sort of context, we'd be reading and go, boy, this person sure is racist. He's talking about segregation and stuff. But when we understand the context and understand this was written in 1950, we interpret the article differently. By 2011, racism is pretty much thankfully gone in America. We'll interpret it completely differently than the 1950 one. So we have to think about the subject in the context of the time period that it was written, the location it was written, things like that. So that's subject. Um, how about purpose? What does purpose mean? Objective. Yeah, the objective of the writing, exactly. So it's basically, you know, the author sat down to write this thing, and this took a lot of time, right? To write an essay, it takes, you know, hours of research, hours of drafting, revision, probably peer review and stuff like that. This is not something that people take lightly. So this person must have had some idea that she was trying to get across. So we have to understand why did the author sit down to write? Um, what is the idea or a series of ideas that she really wants to express to you? Um, and then most importantly, what does she want you to get out of? Well, she's probably not just writing it for her own amusement. She probably wants to make sure that you get some information or you learn something or you are convinced to buy into her ideas or something like that. So there's lots of different things we need to think about, but understanding why the author is writing something goes a long way toward us understanding the article itself. Now, how about audience? Who are you writing for? Yeah, who are you writing for? These are easy because they're pretty you know, self-explanatory, right? Subject, purpose, audience. The audience is who you're targeting with this particular article. So you're going to interpret things differently, and the author is going to write things differently, depending on who her audience actually is. Um, so let's say you're reading an article, and let's say it's in a medical journal or something. So this is targeted, a medical journal would be targeted toward doctors and medical researchers. What kind of assumptions can you make about a text if you know that it's targeted toward doctors and medical researchers? What's that text going to look like? We have a lot of medical lingo. A lot of medical lingo and stuff, right. Would you expect the average education major to get it? Probably not, because you know most of us, or most of you guys, and you know me too, as an English major, I know nothing about medicine. I've never taken any uh, you know anatomy classes and stuff like that. So if you're writing for an audience of doctors and medical researchers, you know that you don't have to worry about whether the uh, education majors are going to get it or not. You can use that complicated lingo because your audience is going to understand it. Now let's say we're reading a textbook and it's written for college students, but it's still about you know say anatomy or something. How is it going to change? How is it going to be different from something that's intended for people who already have their medical degrees? Say what? Yeah, maybe not as complex, right? It's going to be geared down a little bit. It's still going to be fairly technical, but it's going to define these complicated terms and stuff. While we understand that the doctors and the medical researchers already know all this stuff, the people reading the textbook still have to learn about it. So it'll be complex, but not nearly as complex. And it'll be geared more toward uh, educating us rather than informing us about you know, the most uh, recent advancements and stuff. Now, say it's children. How are you going to teach children about medicine? Lots of pictures. Pictures, stuff like that. You picture like Bert and Ernie you know, teaching you about washing your hands after you sneeze, something like that. Yeah, so kids, it's going to be geared in some way toward making children understand. Still will be, you know, valid information, but it's going to be totally differently uh, constructed if it's intended for an audience of children. So we need to think about who the audience is and why the author has written it in this particular way. These are the first things we're going to think about when we start reading an essay. So, after we've um, figured out what the author has considered when he or she sat down to write, it's time to actually start thinking about the article itself. So, when we read any article, 
any article you're reading for this class or any other one, there's some things that we need to ask ourselves to make sure that we understand uh, basically what the author is trying to get across to us and how we can use this on our own. So I'm going to show you guys an example text, and then we're going to use this piece of text um, for answering several of these questions and kind of doing a little bit of critical reading. So this is a text uh, that Ms. Kaufman actually sent to me. So hopefully this is something that you guys are either have already read or are going to read or are familiar with. Um, but this was from that Generation M text. Have you guys looked at that yet? No. Yeah. They're going to be looking at it at some point? Okay, well this is a text, and I kind of uh, glanced over it. Again, it's not my specialty, but it looks like um, it's basically about how are different types of media, like DVD players and uh, video games and stuff like that, how are children using them in their homes, and what does that say about them and their socioeconomic status and stuff like that. So let's check out the article. Can I get a volunteer to read this first? Okay, we got two volunteers. All right, we'll start with I'm sorry, I don't know anybody's name, so I'm just going to have to point, but go ahead. Socioeconomic status, the likelihood of a youngster having a VCR DVD player or video game console in the bedroom is negatively related to the level of parent education. That is, children whose parents have no more than a high school education are significantly more likely than those whose parents completed college to have a VCR or DVD in their bedroom, and they are more likely than both those whose parents had some college and those whose parents completed college to have a video game console in their bedroom. The percentage of children with either of these kinds of media increased significantly from 1999 to 2004, but at a greater rate for those from the lowest parent education category. Okay, thank you so much for reading that. Um, now, there's many, many paragraphs exactly like this in this article. And there's paragraph after paragraph. You'd have to read tons of this in a row. And it's real easy, even in a single paragraph, to kind of get that eyes glazed over mode. So we have to think, all right, it's not going to be useful for me at all to read all these paragraphs if I'm not absorbing the information. So when we attack a paragraph like this, we have to ask ourselves some questions to make sure we get the very most out of it. So here's the questions. You go ahead. Um, oh, yeah, actually, first of all, let's think about those authors' considerations before we get into the questions. So what were the three authors' considerations, first of all? Subject, Subject purpose, and audience, right? Okay, so the subject of that thing that we just read, what's the subject? Say again? Socioeconomic status of the DVD and Yeah, exactly. They're talking about the uh, socioeconomic status of the parents and also how likely the kids are to have uh, DVD players and stuff like that. Um, how about the purpose? Why is this person telling us this stuff? Because aware of the yeah, she probably wants to make us aware. They've done this study. They spent all this time and money doing the research, and they want to report to us this information, make us aware of how socioeconomic status affects the likelihood uh, that your kid is going to be spending lots of time playing video games and stuff like that. The audience. Who do you think the target audience of this particular article or uh, series of articles is? People in education. Say what? People in education. Probably so. How can you tell it's geared toward people who would be somehow, you know, related to education, as opposed to geared toward, uh, you know, doctors and stuff, or geared toward children. Well, it's obviously not made for children, right? Would a kid understand that? If he was reading it, no. How can you tell it's not geared toward like advanced psychologists and stuff? You know, people uh, who've been studying psychiatry for 15 years. Right. They're not, you know, bogging us down with all sort of medical jargon and stuff that we couldn't understand. If we get by reading this, that this is made for a more general audience, probably a group uh, like educators and stuff like that. Maybe also some child psychologists and stuff. But the language is geared toward people uh, a more broad audience than we would have with something like uh, a medical journal. So the target audience is probably people like education makers, and that's probably why you're going to be reading it in this class. Okay. So you can go ahead. Um, okay. Once we um, have figured out the author's considerations, and now we can understand the context of the thing, we can go ahead and start asking us questions that are going to help us understand the article. So here's the questions we're going to want to ask. First of all, what is she saying? Second of all, what am I supposed to get out of this thing? And third, how can I respond? Each one of these is important in its own way, so we'll deal with them one at a time. So first of all, what is she saying? 
As you're reading through this thing, you want to be actively reading, looking for things that are going to help you understand what's actually going on. Um, so one thing that you'll be on the lookout for is keywords and ideas. So as you're reading, if you're paying attention, things will sometimes jump out at you as, ooh, this looks like it might be something important. This looks like something I should probably pay attention to. Now, what I'm going to recommend, um, as long as you've got a text that belongs to you, there's no reason you can't write as much as you want in this thing. And if you're going to have to use this text later to answer questions, to write essays, uh, to study for a test, it's going to be much more useful if you annotate it. And annotating basically means you go in and you add your notes or your highlighting and underlining and stuff to make it more useful for you later on. So I suggest as you're reading, you look for key phrases and ideas and stuff and highlight or underline. So let's take a look at this article with some keywords. Do that more time. Some keywords highlighted and underlined. So this was what jumped out to me. First of all, the heading of the article, socioeconomic status. Okay, well, this particular chunk of the article is focusing on this topic of socioeconomic status. I noticed they're talking about different types of media, the VCR and the DVD player and then the video game console. I see this term negatively related. Well, that sounds important. That's like a statistical term. I see things about parent education, whether they're in high school or whether they've completed college. I see uh, down at the bottom, information about how this has changed over time. Things have increased in the last uh, five years of the study or whatever. Um, and we see also things are increasing at different rates based on parent education. So now we have you know, a 100 word piece here with maybe 10 important words highlighted. Now we've begun to narrow it down to the most useful stuff. This is going to be more useful for us when we go back to study or write an essay because we don't have to read this entire thing again and again to get the main points. So we got some keywords. One thing we want to make sure is that we understand all the keywords. So if there's something in there and you're like, wait a minute, what does this mean again? It's not helpful unless you completely understand the definition. So a couple of things in there that jumped out to me you know, one more time, um, that you would need to make sure you understood the definition of were socioeconomic status and this term negatively related. So most of us are probably fairly familiar with both of these words. But if you weren't, the article wouldn't make any sense, right? So we see socioeconomic status, okay, well that's going to have to do with the economic and cultural standing of the families and the stuff. So that's what they're looking at to try and determine uh, how socioeconomic status affects these children. Same with all negatively related. Well, what does it mean if something's negatively re related? The definition's up there. <laughs> yeah, it's an inverse relationship. So if, um, you know, it's negative, but well, if it was positively related, it would mean, you know, the higher the education, also the higher probability that kids are going to have uh, DVD players and stuff. Well, since it's negatively, it's the higher the education, the lower probability they're going to have video games. And vice versa, the more video games they have, the higher probability is that they have uh, low education, the parents. So we understand those two terms now. That makes sure we understand what's going on in the article. So we understand what we're talking about. We can move on. Once we get the language, we can start looking for larger key ideas. So we looked for the individual words that were important now. Now we want to start looking for kind of the more big picture ideas uh, that are going on. Um, so we read an entire paragraph. We need to make sure that we don't just read that and forget it. We want to make sure when we go back, we can find out quickly, what is this paragraph about? What was I supposed to get out of it? So we want to try and come up with just a main idea of what each individual paragraph is about. And what you can do if we're annotating the text is actually write this idea beside the paragraph. That way, when you go back later, you don't have to read the whole thing. You just go, oh, this was the paragraph about DVD players and stuff. This was the paragraph about economic status. So you're beginning to have an annotated text. So if we were going to do the main idea of this in one sentence, who can give me something that they feel like is basically the main idea of this paragraph in just kind of one simple sentence? I know y'all are reading over, so I'll wait. A study shows that um, parents with higher education tend to have children with less DVD uh, or uh, uh, entertainment, I guess. Yeah, stuff in their room. Yeah, stuff that's going to distract them. Sure. I think that's a pretty good uh, summary of the paragraph, right? The main idea here is this negative relationship, right? So the paragraph is talking about if you have less education, 
Well, you're probably going to end up with kids who spend more time playing video games and stuff like that. So now we've boiled down 100 words into, what, 10 words? Something like that. Um, so you can go ahead and see what I wrote was pretty similar to that. Parents with low education are increasingly likely to have children who have DVD players and video games in their bedrooms. So if you have that written out to the side of the paragraph, and you have the key words highlighted and stuff, well, now you don't even need to read that whole paragraph again. When it comes studying time, when it comes time to answer an essay question or something, you've got all the answers basically um, in short form. It's almost like you've got the clip notes of the, uh, of the article that you're reading. Do you guys still use clip notes? Spark notes? You can just go to Wikipedia to, to get everything, I guess. Yeah, so I'm not that old, but I use clip notes. So. Um, go ahead. Um, so you do it for every paragraph. And at the end, you've got an annotated article. So like I said, it's the cliff notes. Rather than having to read thousands of words of text, you've got your main ideas outside. You've got your highlighted words. It's a thousand times more useful to you now when it actually comes time to answer questions. OK, so that's question number one. What is the author saying? Question number two is, what am I supposed to get out of this? Well, you read the thing, you understand it, that's fine. But you need to understand also, what exactly am I meant to be gleaning from this article? What kind of information is the most important uh, for me to learn? So, this depends on the audience. Um, let's say we're reading that article. What should a child psychologist get from this article that we just read? What kind of information do you think he's going to take that's important? Yeah. He's going to be paying attention to these terms like negative relationship, right? He's going to say, ooh, well, look, I've noticed that there's a correlation between the education of the parents and the likelihood that children are going to be playing video games. Well, as a psychologist, what do I know about children that play tons of video games? Well, maybe they're not going to get as far in school. Maybe they're more likely to be violent if they play Call of Duty all the time or something like that. So a child psychologist is going to get one set of information out of it. Now, um, how about parents? What should parents take from this? Yeah, sure. If a parent reads this, they might think, ooh, well, I have low education. You know, I just graduated high school, but do I still want to let my kids spend all their free time playing DVD, play, or, you know, watching DVDs and playing PlayStation or whatever? Well, parents are going to take different information. They're going to use this article differently. Um, let's say it's college students. Well, this depends on what your teacher wants. So you need to, when Ms. Kaufman gives you this, you need to say, well, what do you think she's going to want from me? Um, basically, put yourself in her shoes. Imagine you're her for a minute. She's going to give you a test or make you write a paper or something like that. What kind of stuff do you think she's going to ask you? You read that paragraph and think, ooh, I bet she's going to ask me something about this negative relationship. I better remember this stuff. If you think she's not going to care so much whether it's a DVD player or a video game, well, don't focus on that. Try and focus on what you think the teacher is most going to want you to get out of it. So it's going to be one thing if you're taking an education class and another thing if you're taking a psychology class or a, you know, I don't know, they have parenting classes? Well, you get the point. Okay, um, so let's keep in mind what we've learned so far. We've got the first two questions that we asked ourselves, which were, um, you know, what is the article saying and what am I supposed to get out of this? And then we've also thought about the author's considerations, the subject, purpose, and audience, which help us understand the context, why this author was actually writing this thing. Rhetorical trying. Yeah. So here's another example that I want to give you guys. Um, and we're going to use this to do a little more practice with um, these questions that can help you understand an article. So we're going to look at a case study uh, from a child who's in, uh, I guess, a kindergarten class. Do you ever read these case studies and stuff in any of your classes? I see people nodding. Good. Anybody got Dr. Beck? No? OK. Well, this was something I used last semester. I didn't know if anybody would have her or not. Um, so. Here's some background information on this particular case study. And this will help us understand the next section that we're going to see. So, six-year-old Sarah lives with her mother, who has a relaxed schedule. Ms. Mercer, Sarah's teacher, notes that Sarah is often tired and inattentive after arriving late. Sarah says she frequently stays up past midnight if others are up. Ms. Mercer, a second-year teacher, has asked her mentor to observe Sarah and suggest ways to help Sarah achieve Ms. Mercer's purposes. So that kind of gets us set up for this thing we're getting ready to read. So here is an excerpt from somebody's, I guess, notes on how Sarah was behaving in class. We're going to take this thing and use it to answer some questions to think about um, you know, exactly what the article is trying to say. So here's the information from Sarah's class. 
During the math activity, Sarah, yawning frequently, is the last to open her workbook and write her name. When she completes the page, she waits. She seems puzzled, although Miss Mercer has already given directions. Sarah gets up, sharpens a pencil, and returns to the wrong seat. That's my seat, accuses an angry boy. Sarah apologizes and returns to her seat. Later, she waits to have her workbook checked. She has not torn out pages as Miss Mercer instructed. Sarah is told to do it right. Sarah has not creased the paper as Miss Mercer demonstrated so the pages do not tear out easily. Sarah sucks her thumb and holds her ear for a minute. Suddenly, she yanks the paper and the pages come out with jagged edges. She receives three dots for her work. Miss Mercer says, Sarah, this is good. I wish you could earn four dots. That's the maximum. Sarah slaps herself on the forehead. She's messed up, and she's so embarrassed she slapped herself. Poor Sarah. You guys feel bad for Sarah? <laughs> yeah, I do too. Um, so this is a good little example of something that's going on in a classroom that as education majors, you may be asked to weigh in on this in some way. So let's start to think about important information in this and what we can do with this particular article. So, starting off, the author sat down and wrote this information for some reason. So we got to think about the author's considerations. So the subject of that article, what's the subject? Sarah, right? It's Sarah and how she's performing in class. Easy. Subject is always pretty much the easiest one. Uh, how about the purpose? Why did the author write this? Yeah, to reflect on how she's acting in class. What kind of stuff about Sarah do you think he, uh, this author is wanting to get across to us? Lack Attention, lack of sleep, yeah. Something's, something's wrong. Something's causing Sarah to maybe not perform as much as well as she can. So he's trying to give us the, relative, uh, the relevant details that are going to help us figure out Sarah and help us see what we can do to help her. Um, lastly, who's the audience? Who do you think is supposed to read this? All the parents. Parents, maybe? Yeah, who else? Educators, teachers, stuff like that. Yeah, people who can solve problems like this. The parents might be some of them, the teacher might be some, and then other teachers or counselors, people like that, who don't come in and make sure students are doing as best as they can, will also be the kind of people that might be interested in this. So, moving on, we've got you know, our author's considerations. We've also got our different questions that we want to ask to make sure we understand the article. So number one is, what is she saying? Now, keywords and phrases are important here. In the previous article, we had a couple of technical terms like the negative relationship and um, the socioeconomic status that we needed to make sure we understood. Well, in this particular article, there's not really anything that we're not going to understand. It's all layman's terms. So we want to just not so much worry about you know, what do these words mean. We're going to be able to look out for important words, words that the author is using to prove his or her point, and words that we might be able to use later to help prove our point when we get to uh, the question number three, which is how can I respond to this? So I think of these things as red flags. As you're reading along, sometimes you're reading and you're like, ooh, whatever the author just said there sounds really, really important. I should remember that. I should pay attention to that. I might be able to use that in the future. These are the kind of things you're going to want to highlight or underline because these are the kind of things that are going to be most helpful to you. So, um, let's take a look at this thing. Go ahead and take it the time. Here's this same paragraph. What kind of things stand out to you guys as red flags? Yawning. Yawning frequently, sure. You put that in there for a reason. Say what? What's the next one? Seems puzzled. Seems puzzled. Okay, sure. Yeah, we've got her yawning frequently. So that's telling something about her. She seems puzzled. She does what? Sits in the wrong seat. Sits in the wrong seat. Seeing a list of symptoms, things she might be doing wrong, sure. Sucks her thumb, okay. What else? I think that's several good ones. We don't have to pick every single one right this instant. But yeah, anything that looks to you like it might be, first of all, something that the author put in there to make sure he gets his point across, and second of all, something that you can use in some way uh, when you respond, those things would be your red flag. So let's see what I highlight. All right, I did that yawning frequently. You know, because it says something about how she's tired. I see that seems puzzled. You know, something she's confused for some way. Uh, she apologizes. Well, you know, maybe uh, you know she feels like she's always at fault. Maybe that's why she's always apologizing. She doesn't want to assert herself. Um, we see words from the teacher. The teacher is saying, "Do it right." Is that the best way for a teacher to you know correct a student? Probably not, especially a, you know, a kindergarten student. I don't know much about teaching kindergarten, but I know if you scold the student, the student may not learn as well as if you, you know, correct them in a more positive manner. Um, 
She sucks her thumb and holds her ear, so we see some uh, you know, physical <coughs> symptoms of possible psychological issues she's got. And then we see the same thing, her slapping herself on the forehead. What's that mean, you slap yourself on the forehead? What? Yeah, you're like punishing yourself. It's like, oh, how can I be so stupid? So what, how does this girl, you know, when she walks away from class, how does she feel? That, right? She, she's not being made to feel like she can learn. She's not being made to feel like she can, you know, get better and stuff. She probably, you know, feels stupid. Teacher makes her feel stupid. Classmates make her feel stupid. She slaps herself on the forehead. So we've got our red flags here. So if we want to think about the main idea of this paragraph, remember when we're annotating, we said we want to write the main idea out to the side of each paragraph. So in one sentence, basically, what would you say is the main idea of this paragraph we just read? Sure. Lack of sleep could be, you know, negatively affecting the child's learning or something like that. Yeah. Or we could be more specific to Sarah even. S specifically, what does Sarah's problem seem to be? Lack of sleep, something with her mom, causing problems. Yeah. And is the teacher helping? Not as much as she could be, right? So we got several things in here. Lack of sleep hurting her. Could be the mom's fault that she's getting this lack of sleep. Could be the teacher's fault that uh, you know, the problem is not being dealt with. So uh, here's what I wrote. Sarah seems tired, distracted, and falling behind, and her teacher may not be handling the situation correctly. So that was just my you know, summation of it. I think y'all are probably right to point out something with the mom, too, um, you know, because mom seems to be another part of this problem. So yeah, we've got that written out to the side now. We've got our key words highlighted. Again, we don't have to read the entire paragraph anymore. We have our annotated text, which is much more useful. So that was question one, what is she saying? Now we do, what am I supposed to get out of this? So what is the author trying to tell us here? Well, that's the main idea, right? Sarah's not doing as well as she could. People are not helping her as much as she could. Um, what do we think of Sarah? She has issues, okay? But are they her fault? I feel bad for Sarah. Feel bad for Sarah, right? We feel sorry for her. Yeah, she's got some issues. But, you know, it's not necessarily her fault. Um, what do we think of the teacher? Teacher is trying, but it's not doing her best to help Sarah, I sure. guess, figure it out. Sure, yeah, the teacher's trying. You know, maybe the teacher's trying to correct her, but she may not be doing the best, exi uh, you know, exactly the best methods to help Sarah, um, you know, learn how to solve her problems and to be the best student she can. So we've got poor Sarah, and we've got teacher, and eh, maybe not as good as she could be. Um, so those are a couple, of the, a couple of the main ideas we're getting out of here. Sarah has some issues that are, may or may not be her fault. The teacher may not be solving them correctly. Now, that's the first two questions that we've dealt with so far. Here's the third question. And this may, for you guys, be the most important one, because it's the one that's going to help you write essays. Uh, it's going to help you answer essay questions on tests or whatever kind of studying you have to do. Um, how can I respond? You get any kind of reading, your teacher is probably going to want you to respond to it. Um, in some way. So when you give your responses, most of the time what your teacher is going to want is a combination of the information that you just learned from this article, so information about Sarah and the teacher and stuff, and also information that you already know from class. Remember, you've been in class for you know, a month or whatever now, you've learned some stuff, you can impress your teacher by showing her that, hey, not only did I understand what I read, I understand how it relates to the other stuff you've been teaching me. I've actually been paying attention in class. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Here's some tips that are going to help you make sure you respond in a way that's going to uh, you know, impress your teacher and give the best answer that you can. So first of all, you want to be on the lookout. Like I've got this picture of the guy here standing on the boat looking up. You want to anticipate important information. Remember, as you're reading this stuff, your teacher didn't just give it to you because she likes to make you read. She gave it to you because there's useful stuff in there. You want to be on the lookout for stuff that's going to be helpful uh, when you answer questions. So those key ideas that we're highlighting are the kind of things that are probably going to help you. So be on the lookout for key ideas like that. You'll underline uh, you know, phrases, stuff like that, that you think could be useful when you're answering the question. So if we look at this thing, I've highlighted uh, three different sentences that to me seem especially important. These to me look like if I was going to be asked to respond to this question, these sentences would be the kind of things that I could use in a response or I could consider in a response to make sure I get the best answer possible. So she seems puzzled, although Ms. Mercer has already given directions. That shows me that Sarah is not really getting it. 
Uh, she has not torn out pages as Ms. Mercer instructed. Sarah is told to do it right. Well, there's an example of the teacher maybe not necessarily responding as well as she can. Ms. Mercer says it's good, da 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 da. Sarah slaps herself on the forehead. Again, we see a physical uh, manifestation of Sarah's psychological issues along with the teacher not necessarily responding correctly. So, um, those phrases that we underline are helpful for us because you know, they provide evidence that Sarah's having trouble. So, when you do a response, it's a good idea to try and respond basically in the same kind of language as the thing that you've actually been reading. If you're writing an essay, it would feel really weird if you responded in a tone or a voice that was totally different uh, than what the essay that you've been reading. So pay attention to the kind of language that the author is using. If you're reading a case study like this, you'll probably want to respond in the same kind of language that people would use in a case study, because your audience is probably going to be similar. Wouldn't make sense to respond with all kinds of medical jargon to an article that doesn't have any of that medical jargon in it. So you think about the tone. You don't want to be writing in some sort of you know happy, funny tone and stuff if it's a you know more somber, serious article. Uh, voice. You want to make sure you're writing in an academic voice if it's an academic article that you read. Whereas a more informal piece, you could respond in a more informal voice. And in conventions, things like abbreviations, contractions, stuff like that. You know, a lot of teachers tell you no, never use a contraction. Well, if your source that you're reading is using contractions, there's no problem with you using contractions to respond. Same with abbreviations. If they always call, um, you know, I don't know the name of any education committee. Let's say there was like a federal education committee or something, the FEC. I just made that up. Um, but they always called it the FEC. Well, you can always call it the FEC too. So respond in similar language as uh, the article actually uses. Also, those keywords and ideas that you've seen in the article are going to be really useful tools for responding. If you pick up a key phrase, like in our previous example, socioeconomic status or negatively related, and then you spit that word back out when you give your response, your teacher is going to say, hey, they understood it. They learned something. They know that key word, and they can use it on their own. So I would try and integrate these keywords and phrases and stuff um, into whatever response you're giving to make sure people understand, yeah, they really got what they were supposed to get out of it. The other thing you can do, like I said, is integrate the knowledge that you already have from taking this course. Um, if you've been in here for a month or if you've been you know, an education major for a couple of years, well then you're already beginning to be kind of a master of this subject. You know a lot of stuff about it, you've read a lot of stuff, your teachers have taught you a lot. If you can prove to them that I've absorbed it and I'm ready to use it, they're going to be impressed. So here's um, an example of what you could do to show the teacher that you paid attention to what you read and you're learning stuff. Sarah likely suffers from attention deficit disorder. Well, it doesn't say anything about attention deficit disorder in that article, but if you've taken some you know, education classes and some child psychology classes, you're probably somewhat familiar with it. This, combined with her parents' inability to get her to class on time, causes Sarah to struggle. Ms. Mercer should consider meeting with Sarah's parents and discussing, and I just put famous child psychologist, you know, I don't know a famous child psychologist, uh, discussing Joe Smith's advice for improving performance at home and school. Well, if you drop a famous child psychologist name in there, and that guy is the right guy who, you know, talks about this particular, yeah, don't just put some random one, and don't put famous child psychologist. But if you put, you know, the right one who actually does have some theory that has something to do with this, your teacher's going to go, wow, this person really gets it. This person's really paying attention. This is the kind of response that really responds to the text and shows the teacher how much you've learned and just how smart you are by integrating your course-specific knowledge. Another thing you can do to help yourself um, answer the questions is look ahead. You know, this is not cheating, but a lot of times if you're doing like an essay test or if you're doing... Um, you know, even just a regular test with multiple choice questions or having to write an essay, you're going to know the questions you're going to have to answer in advance. So for this particular thing uh, that I read, well, yeah, if you read them first, you'll have a good idea of what you're going to have to be on the lookout for. So here's some questions that were asked about this article. I took this article from an actual education test. Now, remember, the article's written here. The questions are written at the end. Well, the questions are not covered up. There's no reason you can't read those questions and understand what you're looking for before you start to answer that, or before you start to actually do the reading. Same if you know I'm going to have to write an essay about this particular prompt. Well, now you can read the essay or read the text, knowing the kind of information that you're going to need to write the essay that you have to eventually do. So here's the two questions. 
part of the question. Ms. Mercer is concerned that Sarah is often tired and inattentive after arriving late to school. And here's the two things that we're going to be asked to get out of this. Identify two specific actions Ms. Mercer might take to connect school and Sarah's home environment for the benefit of Sarah's learning. So in order to answer that question, we're going to obviously have to know something about how Sarah is behaving, how her parents you know, currently are uh, handling things at home, and how teachers are currently doing things. And then second, for each action, explain how that action will benefit Sarah's learning. Base your response on principles of fostering positive relationships with family and support student learning and well-being. Well, that question is just crying out for you to integrate your course-specific knowledge. They're basically saying, oh, explain, to, uh, explain particular actions uh, based your response on principles of fostering positive relationships. Well, this sounds like stuff that this teacher, uh, you know, Dr. Beck, given this stuff, would have expected you to learn it in her class. So knowing those questions helps you really know, okay, what do they want me to get out of this? How can I use it? How can I respond? So the basics, the main things to remember about when you're doing critical reading. We've got our rhetorical triangle, the author's considerations that help us just kind of understand where the author is coming from uh, with a particular article. So we've got subject, what the article's about, purpose, why the author sat down to write it, and audience, who the author is targeting, who the author actually expects to be reading this thing. Um, we've also got the critical reading questions. What is she saying? What am I supposed to get out of it? And how can I respond? If you're able to understand all these things, come up with an annotated text, you shouldn't get that eyes glazed over feeling. You should be reading actively, constantly on the lookout for things like this. And it should not, you know, it's not like the reading's going to be easier, but everything will be easier after the initial read. Because from then on, all the notes are there, all the information's there. You can just go through and use your own annotation to make things a million times easier on you when it's time to respond. Okay, so you can click it one more time. That's the critical reading part of the lesson for today. Now, now that we understand how to actually read these things, we need to understand how we're going to use this information when we're responding. Now, in a few weeks, we'll talk about quoting and stuff, but for today, we're going to focus on summarizing and paraphrasing, which are two very, very effective methods of getting information from a text into whatever kind of written response that you have to give. And if you have to write an essay, or you have to answer essay questions, you're probably going to be expected to use the material in some way in your response, and summary and paraphrase will help you do that. So, um, when you're responding to text, that's basically what I just said. <laughs> You'll need to reference the text. Um, like I said, sometimes we'll be quoting, there's other times when paraphrasing and uh, summary will work best. Paraphrase and summary are the appropriate thing to use when you want to use your own voice. Obviously when we quote, you'll be bringing in words exactly as they appear in someone else's text. Well, there's times that that works really well, and we'll discuss that later. But there's other times when you want to keep things in your own voice. That's when you're going to want to summarize a paraphrase. So, why would we want to use our own voice as opposed to integrating someone else's words? Well, there's several reasons. Um, first of all, you can control the length and structure of the information. Say you've got a whole page of material that's all really, really good. Well, you don't want to quote that entire thing and take up a whole page of your essay with a giant quote, unless you're really lazy and you're just trying to get to the five-page limit or whatever. But teachers are on to that. You're not going to fool them. Um, so there's times when you've got lots of good information, and you need to get it a little bit condensed. You need to get that information in there in some sort of shorter form. Well, doing a summary or a paraphrase can help you do that uh, to control the length and the structure of it. Um, let's say the information is really complicated. Say you just read uh, a nuclear physics article, but you know you're going to be writing to an audience of education majors. Well, your education major audience is probably not going to understand the nuclear physics at the level that the person who wrote the nuclear physics article does. So you're going to have to convert things, almost be like a translator, and put it in a language that your particular audience can understand. So summary and paraphrase is a good way to put things in your own words to make complicated information easy to understand. Um, you can tailor the information to fit your specific purpose. So if your purpose is to answer a question, show some methods that uh, a teacher can use to help Sarah learn better, well, you can make sure that you tailor the summary in a specific way that it focuses on those methods, that it focuses on how the teacher can use the particular methods. Um, and lastly, you can keep the tone and voice consistent. Again, it has to do with your audience. If you're writing to an audience, you expect uh, of people who are in the education field, and you, know, you just read something from a complex scientific article, 
Well, you may not want to jam that complex scientific stuff in there when you've been writing in a slightly more informal tone. So you can keep your tone and voice consistent by converting stuff into your own voice. So, summary and paraphrase. Um, these are the ways that you can put things in your own voice. I like to say in your own voice instead of just in your own words, because voice also implies your tone um, and the kind of language that you use, in addition to just the specific words that you use. So what's a summary then? Overview. Overview, yeah. It's just going to focus on the main ideas, right? Yeah, so basically, a summary, go ahead. Uh, the expression of others' ideas in your own words. It's usually just an overview of the main ideas. Um, I like to be a little more specific with the definition of summary and make sure that it really is just an overview. Because summary could refer to any time you're putting another person's ideas into your own words, but I want to make a distinction between what a summary is and what a paraphrase is. So for our purposes, we're going to say a summary is way shorter than the original. So you could possibly summarize a, uh, you know, a long you know, two-page thing into one sentence or something. Like, what's a movie you guys know? What's a movie everybody's seen? Twilight. Twilight. Okay. Has everybody seen Twilight or at least familiar with Twilight? So give me a one-sentence summary of Twilight. Boring. Boring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> give me a one-sentence unbiased summary of Twilight. <laughs> Girl falls in love with a vampire. There we go. How about that? Is that a one-sentence summary? Yeah, it basically says what it's about, and it takes a two-hour movie to our boring movie, if that's what you think, and it condenses it into one sentence. And obviously there's lots of other stuff going on in Twilight with werewolves and whatever else. But for our purposes, maybe all we need to know is what it's about. So summary condenses it a lot. So when to summarize? Um, there's times when you're going to want to summarize and times when you're going to want to paraphrase. So the summary is a good thing to do if the main ideas are important, but the specifics are not. So if you read a whole page, and you're like, ooh, I need to get these ideas in there, but I don't care about all these details. I don't care about all these results of the study. I don't care about all the nitpicky, uh, nitty-gritty kind of stuff. All I care about is the main idea. That's a real good time to do a summary and condense things. Um, so we'll go back to that paragraph we had from Generation M. We got this whole paragraph. If we wanted to summarize it in one sentence, how would we summarize it? Children whose parents have lower education are more likely to have game, more games and DVDs. Yeah, I think that's pretty close, right? Children who are lower, our parents who have lower education are more likely to have children uh, who play more video games. So, what you'll notice, go ahead one more time, it's pretty similar to that main idea thing that we wrote out beside the paragraph when we were annotating the text. Parents with low education are increasingly likely to have children who have DVD players and video games in their bedrooms. So, if we've already got those main ideas written out beside the paragraphs when we did our annotation, now we've got summaries ready to go. If we're wanting to write an essay and said, ooh, that paragraph was really useful, I need to get that information in there, but I'm not concerned with the specifics, well, that main idea that we wrote out beside it would be a perfectly good summary to put in there instead. Um, you see what we've done, we've taken that same idea, but we've made it a lot shorter, and now it's in your own voice. So the voice will remain consistent as you move from the things that you're saying to the ideas that come from someone else, and then back to the things that you're saying again. It won't be as jarring as having a bunch of just long quotes all of a sudden that change the voice. So how do we use this in our papers? Um, if you use someone else's ideas, say you're using someone else's ideas in a paraphrase or a summary, but you're not quoting, do you have to give them credit? Yes. yes, yes. You always have to give credit for ideas regardless of whether it's a quote or whether it's a uh, paraphrase or a summary. So what you do, you use what's called a signal phrase. So I'm giving a signal phrase at the start of this, uh, telling me who the quote comes from or who the paraphrase comes from, and maybe just a little bit of information about that person's credentials, well, now we know this is not the author of this essay giving me this information here. This is the author of the essay giving me information that comes from someone else. You're giving us the indication that, no, these are not your ideas. These are somebody else's. It's important to do this to make sure you're you know, maintaining academic integrity. So as Donald F. Roberts, the guy's name, of Stanford University, something about his credentials, uh, points out in this study, Generation M, tells us where this information comes from. 
That's the whole signal phrase. That's Donald F. Roberts, Stanford University, Generation M. And then our summary, parents low education, da 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 da. So by putting that signal phrase in there, we let everybody know, hey, attention, these are somebody else's ideas. Now, um, depending on what class you're in, you're probably going to have to also give an official citation uh, through parenthetical uh, format or something like that. Are you guys using MLA or APA? MLA? Okay. Um, so depending on whether it's MLA or APA, um, you're going to have different style conventions uh, as to how to do parenthetical citations and stuff. We'll deal with that in session three. So if you have any questions about that stuff, you'll need to come to that session. But for now, just remember that whether you've got APA or MLA, it's a good idea to have those single phrases in there to let the audience know, okay, we're getting ready to hear information from somebody else. So, summary is condensing the information, putting it in your own voice, just taking the main ideas and not focusing on uh, the nitty-gritty details. Go ahead. A paraphrase is a little different. So remember, summary, we're condensing a lot. Paraphrase is different. Let's say we have a 50-word paraphrase, or a 50-word original section. How long do you think paraphrase would be? About the same, yeah. Remember, if we condense it a lot, it's a summary, right? So if we had a 50-word original section, a summary might be 10 or 20 words. A paraphrase is probably going to be roughly the same length. So, you know, it might be 40 words, it might be 60 words, but in general, it's going to be roughly the same length as the original. Um, so a paraphrase, in the earlier one, I said, um, you know, it's getting the author's main ideas in your own words is a summary. A paraphrase is a restatement of the author's ideas in your own voice. So rather than trying to condense it, rather than trying to give just an overview, like you said, you're condensing the ideas, you're trying to, or you're not condensing the ideas, you're trying to restate the ideas, but for the same reasons we said earlier, you don't feel like quoting. You feel like keeping it in your own voice. So. The right time to paraphrase, we said the right time to summarize, was if the main idea was important but the details were not. Well, a paraphrase is useful when the details are important too. You need all that information that's in there, but you don't want to just jam a really long quote in. Because long quotes a lot of times are not appropriate, especially when you're writing a shorter paper, a paper that's you know, five pages long. If you have three or four really long quotes in there, it's going to look again like you're just trying to get to the five page count. So, if you want all that information, but you want to avoid the long quote and keep your own voice, that's when you should do a paraphrase. So, we'll go back to that paragraph about Sarah, and we'll just do the first three sentences. So, during the math activity, Sarah Yoni frequently gets the last open her workbook and write her name. She completes page, she wakes. She seems puzzled, although Ms. Mercer has given directions already. So, if we want to just put that in our own voice, but still maintain all the same information, how can we do that? Anyone want to take a shot at it? I <laughs> see some people like, oh, I don't want to try that one. Anyone want to be brave? Okay, I'll just put mine up there. Yeah. <laughs> Should I have waited longer? Yeah, I think why I went. <laughs> okay, so here's something that would be an acceptable paraphrase. Sarah looks tired while the class did a math activity. She slowly start working. When she finished the assignment, she looked confused about what to do next, even though the teacher had explained the assignment. Is all the same information in there? Pretty much, yeah. Is it plagiarism? No. no. If we gave appropriate credit through a single phrase, this would not be plagiarism, because this truly is our own voice. Now, we have to be careful uh, with, with paraphrasing, because it's real easy with paraphrasing to accidentally plagiarize. I see lots of students who think they're paraphrasing, but they're not really. They're actually kind of just copying and changing words to make it sound slightly different. So you don't want to tread into that accidental plagiarism territory. So let's take a look at uh, another paraphrase. Click it one more time. So we saw our original. Here's an, uh, you know, an attempt at a paraphrase. While doing a math activity, Sarah, yawning frequently, took a long time to open her workbook and write her name. When she was done, she waited. She seemed puzzled, even though Ms. Mercer had given directions already. Is that okay? Why not? If the source that he just changed words? Yeah, that's what people do a lot. They're like, ooh, well, he used the word, um, well, where's an example of something where we just changed the word? <laughs> during, yeah, they just said, okay, well, I don't want to say during, so they right-clicked in Microsoft Word, brought down a little list, and said, ooh, I'll use while. Or what I see sometimes is they'll change it to it is, 
or something like that's enough of a change. No, that doesn't count. So go ahead and show that on our next deck. Click a couple more times. Here I've got in pink highlighted the things that are the same. So you can see tons of these words have matched up exactly the same. Now, as a comp teacher, I get this all the time. People think they're paraphrasing, but really they're not. This is not your voice. This is that other person's voice with you just tweaking it a little bit. And that doesn't count. If you want to use their words exactly, that's fine, but you have to quote. And again, we'll talk about quoting later in uh, session three. If you really want to do a paraphrase, it can't be this similar. You see, you have things like math activity, Sarah yawning frequently, open her workbook and write her name, Mercer had given directions already. Um, you get that many words in a row, exactly the same, it's pretty clear that you're not um, that you're not coming up with those words on your own. My general rule is if you have three or more words in a row that are exactly the same, that definitely needs a quote. If the words are really specific, then you might even have to put a quote around one or two words. But certainly something like this, five words, it's obvious that these are not your voice. This is the other person's voice, and you're trying to get away with something. So be careful with plagiarize, or with the paraphrasing that you don't accidentally plagiarize. I'll show you a trick that'll help you avoid this. So here's the trick. Imagine this guy here in the blindfold. This is what you want to be when you write your paraphrase. Okay? Um, to be certain that you avoid it, here's the trick. Read the passage carefully. Make sure you understand everything that's going on in the passage. Then just go ahead and put it away. If you can write that thing from memory, just basically saying, oh, here's what I learned, well, it's pretty much guaranteed that it's going to be in your own voice. Like this, you know, lecture that I'm giving right now. If I had read all this somewhere else, well, there's no way that I could stand here and say it word for word how I originally read it. If I'm just looking at bullet points, if I'm just going by my memory, even if it came from somewhere else, it's still coming out in my own voice. It's guaranteed that it's a paraphrase or a summary and not me accidentally trying to copy somebody else's words. So, if you put that passage away, just write it from memory, you know, should guarantee that you avoid the accidental plagiarism. Um, you know, you might want to double check and make sure you haven't, you know, treaded into that territory by accident, but it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have six, seven words exactly the same in a row if you're doing it from your memory. Now, just like with the summary, um, you're going to want to give credit with a paraphrase as well if you've used somebody else's ideas. So with this one, you know, I didn't know who the author was, so I just made it up. Jane Doe, the author's name, a child psychologist, observes Sarah in the classroom. So now we know who this person is, we know what her credentials are, and we know, you know, something about where this information came from. She observed Sarah while she was in the classroom. And then we have the, um, the, the actual paraphrase. Doe noticed that Sarah looks tired, da 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 da. So by giving the author credit there, we understand these are not this person's ideas, they are Jane Doe's ideas, and by doing a paraphrase that's truly in your own voice, we see, okay, this is this person talking, not Jane Doe, even though it's Jane Doe's ideas. Now, remember, um, that's not going to be enough usually. Usually you'll have to have your APA or MLA citation, and like I said, we'll cover that in session three. So normally you have some sort of parenthetical citation at the end that says something like Doe 35, but again, we'll deal with that later. Okay. So, to sum up everything that we covered, I know we covered a lot of stuff, and we covered it real fast, but let's hit the main points just one more time. Critical reading. We don't want that eyes glazed over stuff. we got to pay attention uh, to what we read. Um, in order to do that, we've got the author's considerations, which were, what were those? Subjects, purpose, and audience, right? Those are the three things that are going to help us put ourselves in the author's shoes and understand exactly what the author was thinking as she wrote it help us understand the context of the article. We've also got three questions we want to ask ourselves as we're reading uh, the article. What are those three questions? What is she saying? Who is she writing? Yeah, like what, what, what am I supposed to get out of this, basically? Yeah, and then how do I respond? Right. With the what is she saying, we'll be looking for key words, making sure we understand all of them. With what am I supposed to get out of this? Well, that's part of who are they writing to? Who is the audience? What is a different audience supposed to take from it? And then how can I respond? Looking ahead, uh, anticipating you know, important information, stuff like that. Those are the things that's going to help us with the critical reading. You want to make sure you're ready to integrate this stuff into your response, whether it be through a summary or a paraphrase. 
you'll use that summary and paraphrase stuff to get your sources ideas in there in your own voice, which remember, for many reasons, we might want to use our own voice rather than by having lots and lots of long quotes. Um, and then lastly, you'll have your style guide, you'll have your MLA or your APA guidebook or a website or something that you go to, and that will make sure that you give the source appropriate credit at all times, and that's the stuff we'll cover in more detail in session three. And that is it. I know we went through it really fast. Um, does anybody have any questions about all the stuff that I talked about today? I did such a fantastic job, and nobody has any questions? Good. So, um, there's like one more thing if you click it. Yeah, it just says next week. You know, two weeks from now, we're doing session three. That's the one where we'll talk about uh, quoting. We'll also talk about AP format, and we'll talk about or, you know, APA and MLA format. We'll also talk about um, how to begin drafting and organizing for your paper. Next week, we'll be talking about what I call technical difficulties. These are the common errors that people make again and again. Problems with uh, punctuation and grammar and stuff, and also problems with wordiness uh, and other kind of issues that you can come up with um, as you're, you know, doing some basic writing. So you're welcome to come uh, to any of, they are welcome to come to any of the sessions, right? Okay, <laughs> they're welcome to come to any of these sessions. They're in yes. my classes, they can come. Okay, yeah, um, so it's in, the next one's in your class, right? Yeah, room 307. I've already invited you. I'm sure that y'all have read the emails. Yeah. I'm happy to see, you know, it's much more fun. Last year I taught these through teleconference and there were like, you know, maybe five people um, at the lessons and, you know, they were, 25 miles away, or however far Spartanburg is from Greenville. So it's exciting to actually be here and to have lots of people in the room. So I'm really happy that everybody came. So I'll be, I hope in, you all, I'll yes. be in room 307, which is in the far opposite corner from where we are now. Okay, good. So everybody knows where to find. So did y'all learn something? Yeah. Did y'all enjoy yourselves? Yeah. Good. Well, thank you for having me. You're good.